but we have somebody sings it. Actually, Rose, is Mim going to be on this? I hope so. I invited her, but I hope so. But uh, you never know with busy Mim. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If Mim is on it, then I'm going to ask her to sing the national anthem. That would be nice. She'd do it. Oh, Ava Martin. We'll just admit her. Bill Carr. I'm going to admit him. I know him. Um, but if not, then we have somebody else who will sing it. Good. Hello, Ava. <laughs> All right, we're about ready to get started. And then All we have right. just a few announcements and, um, and then we'll just go into the program and I'll start with you, Rose. I'll share pictures and then we'll go to you, Lori and Elizabeth, I have your pictures. Um, Ava, I have your pictures too. So I'll unmute you. Jerry, I don't have any pictures of you. How are you, Jerry? I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, thank you. I just thought I'd listen in. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a member, right? Yeah, 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 okay. yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Right. We're going to get started in a second. Hey, Bill Carr, good to see you. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. All right. We are about ready to go live. Okay, yeah. So I'll uh, cue up the theme music and uh, we'll get this program started. <laughs> All right. <laughs> everybody to VBC at Home Live on this Monday, July 13th. I'm Todd DePastino and I am the host and also the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club. And VBC at Home Live is a production of the Veterans Breakfast Club where we get veterans together with just members of the public and we get veterans to share their stories. And in tonight's case, these are veterans of a service organization that has been entwined with the US military for the past 120 years. And that is the Red Cross. Uh, some of you, we have many guests. If you look at our at our faces here on the Zoom side, you'll see we have a lot of new faces, and some of them served as what some of you will remember as donut dollies during the Vietnam War. Uh, so we're going to hear from some Red Cross volunteers, some donut dollies, uh, learn a little bit about the Red Cross, and hear about their veteran service and their service to our country and and to those who uh, served in our military families and, and veterans. Uh, but first, let me introduce myself again, as people are still getting in from the waiting room. My name is Todd. I'm the director of the Veterans Breakfast Club, and we are a Pittsburgh-based nonprofit that creates platforms like this where veterans can connect with, uh, with the public through their stories. And we've been doing this in Pittsburgh since 2008. And since March, we've been doing these, the, these our events virtually and really reaching people around the country. And it's been quite exhilarating. Uh, with me, I have a I have intern, Libby DiPastino. She's on this side of me here as I'm looking at my Zoom screen. We call her intern, we call her college. She's also known as my younger daughter, Libby. Over <laughs> here on this other side, we have the older one, Ellie. She is our media producer and, uh, our, and she's in charge of communications, uh, meaning she answers emails. And then we also have Lauren Del Ritchie, who's associate director. How long have you been with the Veterans Breakfast Club, Lauren? I think it's coming up on, I know it's definitely been three years, coming up on like, I can't believe how fast the time is. I going. think it's three years this month. Is it this month that's three I, th I think, I think you, yes. I think you started on the fellowship with the Veterans Breakfast Club in July of 2017. That sounds I think, right. I that's think. Fun. And then finally we have new guy, 
Sean Hall, he's our uh, director of programming. Hello, Sean, how are you? Great, how are you? You have a six month old or seven month old daughter. Will she be joining us at all this evening? I think she's, she's being watched by her mother, but okay. uh, maybe she'll join us. Okay, okay. Well, she's always welcome to join us. Um, you know, we always like to begin with the national anthem. And I was hoping that Rose Gantner's sister, Mim Bizik, would be joining us because she has a beautiful singing voice and she yeah. is not shy about singing. Uh, but I don't see her here on the Zoom side. So that means we're going to have to turn to our old friend, Marianne Mangini. And uh, Ellie, why don't you put on Marianne and she could chime us in here. <laughs> is a pro. She is excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne Mangini, for uh, lending your beautiful voice to our program here. Well, welcome once again. My name is Todd. You're watching uh, BBC at Home Live. And um, I do want to, before we get started, I do have a few announcements. One of them is that we're, we have a special event coming up a week from tonight. A week from tonight is our MRE uh, dinner and a show event. This is a event where uh, for $25, believe it or not, for $25, you will get dinner in the form of a meal ready to eat, like one of these right behind me. It, it could God, be- I have one already. Look. You have one? <laughs> I was ready. I was your Vanna. You didn't see me. Oh, no. Yeah, you have one. You're holding one up. What are you holding up? I'm not sure. And I wanted to ask really quick, the tuna, because um, I know they're supposed to like heat up. So I guess you wouldn't heat the tuna up, but I have tuna chunk light menu number 21, warfighter recommended, warfighter tested and warfighter approved. And I have Southwest style beef and black beans and also warfighter recommended and tested. And what is, and Sean, what are you, what are you sporting here? Menu nine, uh, beef stew. All right, very good. Yes, there are 24 active menus right now. And anybody who attends, I'll put a menu in the mail. You can make a special request. If we have it, I'll send it to you. And uh, we will open them up at 6 p.m. on Monday, July 20th. And we will have this meal together. We'll hear some stories about food in the military. You will give your review of your menu item. We will have musical entertainment with a band. Isn't that correct, Lauren? Yeah, we're hoping uh, Major Morgan will join us again with her bandmates. Um, so we look forward to that and maybe another special appearance. I was hoping that we'd be more than hoping that she'd be joining us. Well, uh, we, you know, we, we never have to make sure. We have to her. confirm Major Morgan uh, will be with us. Uh, and we also, I can confirm that we are going to have two special guests with a really wonderful story. Uh, it is Butch and Eric Rahman, whose father, Dr. Abdul Rahman, is the father of the MRE. He is the one who spent 10 years in a lab in Natick, Massachusetts for the army coming up with the MRE. 
And every night he would come home from the lab and he would bring these strange food items to his kids and have them eat them. So they are, Eric and, and Butch Ramen are the first kind of people to test these MREs and they have wonderful stories about it. Uh, Eric actually is a Colonel in the army today and Butch, he has three sons active duty in the army. So uh, we'll have the, them here as a special guest. Please do join us. Ellie has just put in the Zoom side, at least in the chat, the invitation, the registration information for uh, on uh, for Eventbrite. And if you could do that also on the Facebook side, Ellie, that would be wonderful. Uh, as you know, we have BBC at Home Live twice a week. We have it Monday nights at seven, and we also have Wednesday at 1 p.m. And this Wednesday is Wednesday, July 15th, and the following day is the 16th. And July 16th is the 75th anniversary of the moment that the world entered the nuclear age. At 5.30 in the morning, uh, the, a plutonium bomb exploded at the Trinity test site at the White Sands Missile Range, just northwest of Alamogordo, New Mexico. And it was the most powerful explosion in the history of the world by far, a uh, man-made explosion. And, uh, and that it changed the world. And so we thought that we would dedicate our program on Wednesday to all those servicemen and women who worked with nuclear weapons in one form or another, in the Air Force, in the Army, and we will have some wonderful veterans joining us. I see Earl Edwards. He was in the Army, uh, worked at Nike Missile Sites. Hi, Earl. I'm glad that you'll be with us. Um, I know we'll have Norm Wien, uh, who worked in the Air Force with, uh, with uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, George Millershorn, who also worked at Nike test sites, which were nuclear tipped, though I don't think Pittsburghers knew that at the time. Earl, could you verify that? Did here in Pittsburgh, did we know that those Nike missiles were nuclear tipped? Oh, I'm going to have to unmute you here, Earl. Oh, we kill, still can't hear you. Okay, we'll have to come back to you, Earl, with that question. Uh, I think I think that uh, that Americans didn't know that they were they were nuclear weapons in our backyard, and so that's going to be the story. And the so if you were a veteran and you worked with uh, nuclear weapons, what Bert Kennedy, you'll be joining us. Um, if you worked with nuclear weapons in one form or the other, uh, we would love you to join us on Wednesday at 1 p.m. at this Zoom address, and then on Friday mornings at 9 a.m. we have our VBC Coffee Hour. That is always fun. Everybody is welcome to join us, and I hope you do. Uh, join us on uh, Friday, July 17th at 9 a.m. for our coffee hour. Finally, one other, one other announcement, and this is, this is a, a request. The following Wednesday, a week from Wednesday, Wednesday, July 22nd, we would like to have a program about drill sergeants. <laughs> In the Air Force, you called them training instructors, didn't you, Jerry? Were they called training instructors? No? Okay. That Ben Ben Wright told me they were called training instructors, right? Weren't they, Ben? Yeah, in the Air Force, we called them TIs. TIs. Or, or training instructors, right? Yes, and they were the nice, gentle people who kind of taught or you things. the bear hats. Right. They wore the smoking uh, the bear hats. Less right. than gracefully told you what to do. <laughs> they very gracefully, yes, kind of taught you the ways of the military. Um, right. And so we're going to, we would like to have, if you know any people who served as drill sergeants or as TIs, or as, what were they called in the Navy, Lauren? Company commanders? Company commanders, CDCs. Company commanders um, in the Navy. Please do let us know. We'd love to have them on and have them share their stories about what a difficult job that was. And I know it's a very difficult, but from what I've heard, very rewarding job being a, being a drill instructor. Um, Coast Guard called them drill instructors. Drill instructors. Coast Guard called them drill instructors. Yes. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. That's what they should be called. Usually the Navy likes to come up with different names for things. Um, uh, it, it, we also have a podcast called Truth About War, and we just had a new episode released today, didn't we, Sean? Yes. Um, yeah, Mitchell Rose, uh, a local um, Pittsburgher from Braddock. He served in Vietnam uh, in, um, say, the late 60s, early 70s. Um, he became a, a social justice warrior after his cousin, I'm sure you know the name Antoine Rose, he uh, was killed by a police officer in 2018. His, it was uh, Mitchell's cousin. Um, so he sort of became a social justice warrior uh, more recently, but he's got a great story in our podcast, Truth About War. 
Um, I'll pop the website into the chat. Uh, if you haven't given it a listen, we have, I think this is our 11th episode. Um, uh, last week was Tim O'Brien, a uh, famous author. Um, we've had some really incredible names, Alejandro Villanueva, um, some, some really significant and uh, excellent stories that I'm sure you can dive through our history and check out. Uh, but Mitchell Rose is this week. I hope you're going to listen. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, yeah, and Mitchell Rose, yeah, Marine, he served two tours in Vietnam. And interestingly, he connects, he very much connects his uh, service in Vietnam to his activism today. Um, he sees them very much as connected and he very much values his, his, uh, his military service. Um, but, and one more thing before we get started, and I'm going to share my screen here with you. We have Dan Steitner with us, who you know as the president of the Military Community Support Project. Uh, Dan has been a, uh, a very faithful fundraiser for the Veterans Breakfast Club and I think for the, just the veterans community here in Western Pennsylvania gen gen generally. He's worked very hard on behalf of military families. He founded the Military Community Support Project and he has some, event, the Military Community Support Project, and I'm on the board of it, uh, has some events coming up uh, tomorrow, starting tomorrow. Dan, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Oh, well, thank you and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, love to see everyone nice and bright on this beautiful day here in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm in the country right now. Yes, yeah, so the next three weeks, we're going to have some events, uh, online presentations to be value added to the uh, to your group and to any um, active or retired veteran. Uh, tomorrow, we're uh, starting a series, starting with um, some financial information, uh, how to uh, navigate uh, your retirement or do some planning in retirement uh, during these rough times. And uh, Tom Hagna is a Lieutenant Colonel uh, from the Army, spent over 20 years in the military, end up leaving his career uh, quit and starting a new one in helping uh, military families and uh, has expanded to be a national speaker and on PBS. And he's going to talk about how to, you know, about you know your retirement, guaranteeing your income, uh, how to make sure you uh, not just uh, survive but thrive in these period of times. Uh, next week we're going to have talk about uh, Humana is gracious enough to uh, come on board and talk about health insurance during this time, Tricare or Medicare and Medicaid. And uh, we have Megan from Humana. It's going to be a great topic. And then two weeks from now. We're going to be talking about employment and how to find veterans, spouses, uh, jobs during this period of time in the COVID environment and how to pick up your A-game. So we really like, you know, there's a, a website you can register for tomorrow, and then uh, we'll have another registration after that for next week. But really important, this gentleman is a, a nationally known speaker on PBS, MSNBC, Fox <laughs> Business. We were very lucky to get him. Uh, he's heard about the Veterans Breakfast Club, and you know we need. You'd love to have all your people uh, participate, and it's a great. It's an hour from twelve to one tomorrow, and it's definitely worth your time. So I hope everyone would register and just take a listen. Thank you, Dan. I'll be there, Dan. And um, yeah, and the uh, we have the Zoom link in the chat. I hope, and I have the uh, flyer here with the information. So it's retirement income planning uh, tomorrow at noon. And then following week, healthcare planning, and the week after that, kind of career readiness and planning. Yes. All right. Thank well, you thanks. very much, Dan. I appreciate it. All right. And thank you for all you do for the veterans community and for the uh, military community generally. And I know you and I are working on some good, good things for the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. Oh, it's a daunting task, and we got to do it right, and do it good, and uh, do it well, and, 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 and do it justice. Because it's in these times, we can't have like a big face-to-face, in-person celebration. So we're going to do a virtual celebration commemoration of VJ Day uh, on on um, September second. There are two VJ Days. We'll get into that closer to the date, but we're going to have a bigger event on September second. And, and, and I want to just mention we're reaching out to World War II veterans um, because. You know, I really feel, I mean, this is really, a, 75th is a, a, momentum, a monumental anniversary. And it's so sad that a lot of them are dealing with isolation right now. And I really, we're gonna do something special for them. And we're gonna ask the VBC, this is something, you know, we're gonna be doing some, um, 
I wish some of the World War II veterans can turn off their uh, mics right now, but we would like to do something very, very special for them in their period of isolation. And we're going to be reaching out for uh, your group and other organizations for help to do something really, really special. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. You know, we're, uh, the program tonight is about the Red Cross, the American Red Cross. And this is an organization that has really been involved with uh, the U.S. military from the beginning, from almost from its founding in the 1880s. Uh, it was founded, as, as most of you know, by Clara Barton, who was a nurse. And Clara Barton is one of the most remarkable uh, figures in American history, one of the most remarkable women. I believe her quotation was something like this. If I can't be a soldier, then I'm going to help the soldier. And uh, she was not afraid to kind of go on the battlefield and start tending to the wounded, uh, even while the, the shots were still firing. In fact, I believe that she tended to the very first Union soldiers who were wounded in the Civil War. Yep. She, um, she tended to some Union soldiers who were hurt during, I guess you would call it the Street <coughs> Battle of Baltimore, the the uh, riots of Baltimore, it became even before the, the well, I guess it was immediately after the firing on Fort Sumter. Um, and uh, she, you know, had legendary stories about tending to a wounded soldier and a bullet going right through her dress and actually killing the soldier that she was tending to. Uh, she was constantly dealing with supplies problems. She used corn husks for bandages at one point. Uh, she was a formidable character. She was called the angel of the battlefield, but she was really a, uh, if you ever read a biography of Clara Barton, she was unbelievably tough. And, um, and, she, and you know, she, she got the job done. She, she actually got the title of, I love this title, and it was an official title, the lady in charge. She was the lady in charge of uh, Union hospital systems in the Civil War. She went on to found the Red Cross and the Red Cross then uh, really began getting involved in supporting um, soldiers and sailors and Marines who were away from home, uh, who were lonely, who were scared, who were frightened, who were wounded. Uh, they did everything from helping kind of soldiers make contact with the folks back home to tending their wounds. And early in the early years, it was a, there was a lot of nursing done by the Red Cross in the Spanish-American War. Again, in World War I, uh, when you know, tens of thousands of Red Cross uh, nurses, men and women, went overseas and drove ambulances and served as nurses under very harrowing, harsh conditions. Uh, World War II, the mission of the Red Cross changed dramatically. It moved from, uh, it moves from more from medical care, more to um, kind of welfare and, um, and outreach, um, morale, you could say. And uh, in, in England and France, uh, 200,000 Red Cross volunteers kind of followed the allies on their way to Germany. And they often did so in these deuce and a half trucks that you can see here, uh, the, the two and a half ton trucks, the six by six trucks, the, the two, one World War II veteran said, that's the truck that won the war. Uh, these were versatile trucks and they turned them into club mobiles. This is a, a mobile service club that if you know, the, the men couldn't come to an enlisted club or an officer's club in the rear, uh, the service club would come to them and they would bring coffee and they would bring music and they would bring newspapers and magazines, sometimes a celebrity or two. And of course, they always brought donuts. The Donut Company of America donated hundreds of donut machines. And so these <laughs> women began making donuts and by the time of the Korean War, they came to be known as Donut Dollies. That was the, the women were known as Donut Dollies. That was the affectionate nickname that they got uh, for the service that they did in the field. This guy looks like he's a little perturbed, maybe he didn't get a donut yet. Um, and then four, 500, almost 500 Donut Dollies served in Vietnam. And um, they continued to serve kind of uh, after Vietnam in the, in the conflicts of the 1990s and in, uh, since we've had since uh, September 11th, 2001. It's really a, a fascinating story with a fascinating history. And we have several Red Cross volunteers with us here today. And I, I'm gonna ask actually, because I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure that, I wanna make sure that uh, everybody is recognized who served in the Red Cross. And I'm not sure if I know everybody here who did. So I'm going to ask if you can do it on your side and you served in the Red Cross, could you raise your hand, please? I mean that 
you, uh, you, you could do it this way, <laughs> but you could also do it the Zoom way. Uh, you could raise your hand the Zoom way if you want. And why, why don't you, as you're figuring that out and believe, oh, look at Jenny. She figured it out. She got it first. Peggy, these are some of the people who served in the, in the Red Cross. We've got a thumbs up from Dorothy. This is so terrific. Leslie, I'm mm -hmm. going to start here with, I want to get to all of you, but I want to start here with Rose. Hello, Rose. How are you? I'm doing great. This is my first Zoom, so forgive me. <laughs> this is your first Zoom. Yes. <laughs> you're doing you're doing well. This is great. <laughs> and you have some leopards uh, looming over you, or maybe they're cheetahs. Um, Cheetah. Cheetahs. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Rose. My pleasure. What made you want to become a Red Cross volunteer? Oh, I just knew that um, I felt real bad about the war, and I really uh, always admired President Kennedy and uh, what he said and how inspirational he was for our generation. So I, I applied to both the Peace Corps and the American Red Cross, and American Red Cross came in first, and uh, I was delighted to serve there because I had a uh, maternal uncle, Master Sergeant George Mamula, who served two tours, he, he served, excuse me, in World War II and in the Korean War, and he won the Civil Star and Distinguished Service Cross, and he was always my um, hero within our family structure. And this is after you graduated college? Yes, yes. I okay. was 22 my first tour, and I went back the second tour, and I was 24, going on 25. And you ha did you have to be a college graduate to be a Donut yeah. Dolly? Yes, you had to be a college graduate between the ages of 21 to 26, single, um, all different kinds of backgrounds and diversity and disciplines, and uh, basically be a pretty optimistic, enthusiastic person. Yes, and, and, and actually in World War II, at least when they advertised the job, I think you had to be 25 years old, uh, uh -huh. you had to be, but you had to be younger than 35, and you had to be attractive. Uh, and you and you had to be a positive kind of person. You couldn't be a gloomy Gus, I guess, no. sent overseas. Um, uh, so, you, so you had to be a college graduate. You had to be single. And um, I'm going to show a picture of you here. Let me see if I could share my screen again. Um, look, now that looks like the kind of smiling face. You shouldn't be a poster child for donut dollies. I mean... There you are. You're actually the one person in all of Vietnam who's smiling, shoveling, filling sandbags. That's right. I only had to do it for a short time, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's fun when you only have to fill one sandbag. Uh, so what was your first impression when you landed in Vietnam? Oh, it was hot. And uh, I just says, wow, this is going to be an experience. And I was just, a, I'm a very... Uh, positive, optimistic, resilient person. So I knew I was going to make the best of it and do whatever I could to help the uh, service personnel's morale and uh, help in the hospitals in the evening and do whatever I could do to make this world just a little bit better and bring a little bit of home to these soldiers who were so far away. What are the kinds of things that you did? Well, um, and my on first, the first tour, on your first tour. Yeah, yeah my first tour, um, we made we made programs, recreational programs by hand. So it would be like Jeopardy uh, today, but we made all our own materials, our own props. We had to have somebody who was a good writer, someone who was a good actress. We had, um, we had uh, girls from the uh, West Coast, the East Coast, would always have been partners of two and from different parts of the country so that they'd be represented when we'd go out into forward fire bases uh, to help with the servicemen to give them a break for about an hour to play various recreational games and activities as well as talk to them about um, about their tour about their home life their family and bring a little bit of feelings of home and seeing an American girl and just feeling comfortable and having a distraction from such a terrible war oh gosh Rose I gotta tell you I mean it's it sounds like a a lighthearted job, but it it wasn't. It sounds like to me. I think it sounds like a very very hard job. You're flying in cold to these remote fire bases with yes. you know all young men. Um, you have no idea who they are or how miserable they are <laughs> or you know what kind of mental state they're in, and then you have to kind of entertain them for an hour or two, and mm -hmm. then you leave. I mean, that's what you call a we, tough audience. 
yeah, we would do we would do five to seven programs a day like that. And we would work 12 hours a day, six days a week. And then after we'd leave early in the morning on on either choppers or Jeeps, uh, tanks and then uh, return. And then in the evening, we'd go to the hospitals and try to help the nurses at least emotionally heal the soldiers from an emotional point or help them just adjust a little bit better because uh, I couldn't say more about the, the the medical team and everything and everybody who served in Vietnam. It was such a, uh, a team effort and such wonderful leadership and taught us so many good skills. Is this a picture of you out at uh, one of those fire bases maybe? Yes, yes, yes. Wow. And I had, I had an M16, but we're not allowed to show that picture. They showed me an M16. We didn't have our you own weapon, have them. But, but, you know, the guys taught us how, how about the M16 so we could talk intelligently, yet, yet tease them about it and everything. So it was, it was a lot of fun. But we did have to wear those flight jackets and flight vests and helmets a lot when there were more incoming mortar in different places like Pleiku, Ch Chu Lai, and various parts of, uh, of South Vietnam. Absolutely. And and keep in mind, these are volunteers. These are young women who are yes. in a war zone. Uh, I think I think just fewer, a little fewer than 500 of you served during Vietnam. Three of you were killed or did die yes. in service in Vietnam. Yeah. Um, yes. This was not easy in any in any stretch. I mean, just you know, flying to your destination in a helicopter could, could right. get you hurt or or killed. Um, is this you here? Yes, that's uh, Thanksgiving Day serving uh, turkey, oh. the troops out in the, out in the field. Isn't that great? Yeah. Now, uh, here, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a question I'm going to then ask some of the other guests too. Were you harassed? I mean, we would think of it today as sexual harassment. I'm guessing you had to be. I mean, this. I'd say, I'd say uh, 99 percent of the people could not have been nicer and okay. finer and, and more um, appropriate. Right. There's always a one percent that thinks, oh, what's this person doing over there and all that. But that was so minor in comparison to the appreciation and the respect that the soldiers gave us and all were the all, all the service people gave us. Were you afraid? No, I was I was too uh, naive and uh, young and innocent, I think to be really afraid. I was more um, encouraged by desire to do a job and do it well. Is and I had wonderful huh. mentors to help me. You did? So you, people showed you the ropes when you arrived? Yes, yes, absolutely. I had a wonderful unit director, my first tour named Liz Magnum, uh, who had also served in Korea. So that gave me a a heads up and I learned quite a bit very early. And this is Jenny Lucebrink in the middle there. That's also from, uh, was from Pittsburgh. Oh, really? She, yeah, she's deceased now. She's from Pittsburgh too. She was a sweetheart. We're out here with the mountain yard children. Isn't this, isn't that wonderful? Oh, these, these pictures are just so great. Uh, thank you. And there's Liz on the far right, uh, far left side. And this is uh, in play coup at a club mobile there. Okay, at a club mobile. Yes, and then this is out in the Ford Firebase. This is a group of uh, uh, Orthodox people. You know, we asked for a chaplain, I think one Easter, and uh, uh, for an Orthodox chaplain. We didn't think we'd get one, but we did. So then oh, that's right, because you're Serbian, you're Serbian Orthodox. Yes, and Very then the Greek people were, were Greek, and, the, and a beautiful nurse there, she was Russian, so it made it really nice. Oh, how neat. How yeah. great. You know, and you, and you must have liked it enough because you did go back for a second tour. Yeah, I went back a second tour as a supervisor and I got the opportunity to fly all over the country and match girls' personnel skills with their um, with their skill sets and programs and uh, help plan logistics and safety with uh, top military brass. And I was blessed to travel throughout all of South Vietnam and I only spent one day a week in Saigon and I was affectionately called Donut Six. <laughs> <laughs> Donut six, and I love that there's a map there of South Vietnam behind you, and you yes. can see those of you who are students of the Vietnam War, uh, the U.S. broke South Vietnam into four tactical zones: I Corps in the north, then two Corps, then three Corps, then four Corps, and you went up and down the length and breadth of South Vietnam. Yes, and we had 13 units deployed throughout at the time, 
and we had anywhere from um, basically six to 12 girls at a unit, depending on the battalion size and whatever, from the Marines up near the DMZ all the way down to the rice patties with the big red one. Wow. So, so and, and, and every branch of service you, you circulated with, right? Yes, everyone except basically the Navy, except we've got one day to spend on the Navy ship. And uh, that was the first time in uh, 10 months we ever saw silverware and um, really, <laughs> <laughs> they lived quite differently than the yeah. and the four army infantry yeah. and Marines. Yeah, the, the Navy is wondering why we're having, what these MRE things are back here behind me. <laughs> um, so I'll have to ask you, you know, which do you like better, Army or the Marines? I like them all. They're both, they're all tremendous. I thought I, I'd I, catch I you, Rose. I really am a, a, a grunt person. I mean, I just have such affiliation and affinity for uh, everybody who served because you need you need the people not only in the front line, but the support and logistics because it, it all has to work together, as you know, to make anything work in a, in a uh, positive direction. And this is an article that appeared in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette when you returned, I think, from your first tour in 1967. Yes. I love that they did an article on it. Yeah, they wanted, I, I had the opportunity, I volunteered, I, I was teaching at the University of Pittsburgh right then after that, and I, I volunteered to help the Red Cross try to recruit other young women, and I'd tell would tell our stories and I would go and do various speeches and uh, try to recruit girls to join the American Red Cross and tell them what a tremendous journey it, it was and how it changed your life forever for, for a more positive way of learning not only tremendous skill sets, but the leadership and the teamwork and, and the kindness and caring. I mean, the empathy, um, these are friends for life and it's, uh, it's the power of valuing relationships. That's what it's all. And, and so uh, you, you kind of answered this already, uh, but I wanted to ask you, like, what, looking back, you know, these many years later, 50 years later, more than 50 years later, uh, you know, what, what did that do for you as a young woman, those two years, tough years in Vietnam? Oh, I, I had the opportunity to go on and be a, a university professor and teaching psychology and then being a vice president of healthcare companies and organizations and a CEO of healthcare companies for Magellan Health System for over 15 years. If I didn't have that experience in Vietnam at a very young age, I don't think I ever would have had those kinds of opportunities, but I never felt intimidated, never had any fears. And I just knew that you could take any challenge and turn it into an opportunity. And I think the Red Cross taught me all that. And I was blessed to have that opportunity. And to have that challenge at a young age that I mean, nothing could be tougher than what you did, I would imagine. Right. And so when you deal with, uh, you know, uh, uh, profit loss statements or right. personal issues or or somebody's policies or whatever, it's like after you've been in a war zone for two years, it's like, well, that, you know, anything else is uh, minor and rather insignificant, not insignificant, but you, you cope with it well and you grow from it and you you move forward and you never get stuck. You don't get emotionally stuck. You just become more resilient and you grow from it and even learn more. And that's the nice part. And then you pass that on. That's the best part, passing it on to others, those kind of skills and that leadership training. Oh, how great. And that gives you, I mean, it gives you perspective on, on life right. that you can't get any other way. I want right. to turn to, uh, thank you so much, Rose. Thank I wanna... you, Todd. I want to, and we're going to come back to you because I want to ask you some more questions, but I want to go to Lori Pearl. Hi, Lori. Hi, Todd. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. I saw you last. Um, uh, we, we traveled together for two weeks in Vietnam. We did. And, and yeah. it was so great to travel to Vietnam with you because if you were listening to Rose, you heard that, you know, these donut dollies didn't sit in one place. They went everywhere <laughs> and you seem to be everywhere. I mean, everywhere we seem to go, you had been there. And um, I'll, I'll start by asking you the question I asked Rose is what, how did you get involved in this volunteer program with the Red Cross? Um, well, I, uh, it was a big surprise to me when I learned about this program. Um, I was uh, completing my senior year at IUP and um, I, my major was elementary education, uh, and I had intended to be uh, an elementary school teacher. The only thing was when I went to do my student teaching, it was just a horrible experience for me. 
it just was not going to work at all. So I was looking for something else to do. I was, I was back on campus. I was in my last semester and, um, I walked past the, the uh, bulletin board in my dorm, uh, one day and I saw this notice from the campus placement office that the Red Cross was recruiting young women uh, to go and serve uh, in, in Vietnam um, you know, or Korea. Those were the, the two options that were available. And as soon as I saw this notice, I thought to myself, I am going to do that. Uh, and I was so sure that I was going to do that, that it was the only job that I applied for. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I went to the placement office that very day, filled out the application, sent it in. After, shortly after I graduated, got a letter from the Red Cross um, requesting that I come for an interview, uh, which I did. Um, and uh, within about a month after that, uh, I was in Washington, D.C. for training with about 14 or 15 other girls. And um, that's that's how it happened. It was just a, it was just a, a truly intuitive, impulsive decision that I somehow just knew was something that I was going to do. And this was in 1970, I believe, or 71? 1970. And you chose Vietnam over Korea in 1970? What did well, your parents that's, have? That's where everything was, was going on. I mean, you know, uh, so the action was. and by that time, the, the Vietnam War, at least, you know, it was, was uh, in the news every day and had been for like five years. And so really, you know, my late adolescence and, and in through college, that's what was everybody was, everybody was talking about. And, uh, you know, I, uh, it was really, you know, Life Magazine and Look Magazine, which I read cover to cover every single week was full of photographs of what was going on in Vietnam. Uh, so it was so interesting to me when we traveled there to go to some of the museums and places where they had a lot of photographic exhibits and see some of those very same photographs that I remembered seeing in Life and Look magazine. And, that's and I just, I wanted to go and see for myself because, uh, you know, by that time there was so much opposition to the war. There really was no way to... Um, to support the war effort. But I think something that Rose mentioned really resonates with me, which is, I think somehow, um, you know, we uh, understood back then, or at least I did, that there's a difference between the war and the people who fight the war. And I just, I wanted to go and see for myself what was, what was going on. And, you know, just, it just uh, seemed like uh, the right thing to do. Do you remember landing in Vietnam for the first time? Oh, I sure do. What was your impression? I I remember, you know, walking, getting up from the from the seat in the, in the plane and walking down the aisle and just, you know, we got to the open door and there, it wasn't a jetway or anything. It was in Tonsonut in Saigon, and so we were we were, you know, walking out onto one of those stair one of those staircases, you know, that would come right up to the plane. And just this wave of hot, humid air, just, it was just like a, to me, it was like a blast furnace. It was, it was like hard to get a breath. Uh, it was, it was just so intense. And then I imagine that you probably do like a little bit of orientation for a day or two or three, and then do they start sending you into the field? Very quickly. I think, I, I think we were in Saigon. One one full day, maybe maybe two, uh, where the yeah at the the, uh, the program had their headquarters there in Saigon. So we did get, uh, have an orientation, and uh, that's when we learned where our first assignments were going to be, and and who you know uh, who we were going to be going with. Um, and um, I, as far as I remember, the you know the next day we were on a C one thirty to go to uh -huh. our first assignment. Wow. What were the rules you were taught? The do's the and don'ts. Yeah, the do's and don'ts. Well, first of all, you, you had to be single. You had to be a college graduate, 21 years old, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, but what were the do's and don'ts? What did they warn you about? You know, I don't know if they really warned us about 
you know, about really anything. Um, Should they have? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember anyway. <laughs> I have some, speaking of pictures, I have wonderful pictures, a couple wonderful pictures of Lori. This is Lori with the extremely fashionable sunglasses on here. Um, do you still have those glasses, Lori? I do not have those glasses, no. Oh, darn it. No, um, I wish I did, actually. And I, I love this photo because this is like, just like Rose's photos, this, you just get the sense that you're just kind of dropped in it. And you see uh -huh. that orange iron laden soil that's everywhere in Vietnam. And these guys are probably at a remote base somewhere. Do you know where this was? This was at Khe Sanh in oh. 1971. Would have been January or February of 71. And, you know, when we visited Khe Sanh on our trip and what surprised me was that I, I didn't know that the U.S. went back to Khe Sanh. I, I knew that we had abandoned it in July 1968, but I didn't realize that we had occupied it again in 1971 and that's when you were there. I was there, I was there twice and maybe three times. It was a, it was reopened for a very short time of, and it was in support of, of an army of Vietnam, an Arvin um, operation up in, in, that, in that area. And so there were, there were soldiers there. At the time I was assigned at Camp Eagle with the 101st Airborne Division. And so there were 101st uh, Division soldiers there and, and from some other units as well. Um, I think there were some units that, that uh, came from, from Quantry. Um, but pri yeah, primarily we went there to, to visit the 101st soldiers. And so, yeah, we helicoptered in there from, uh, from Camp Eagle. Were you ever afraid? No, I really, I really wasn't. I, you know, I really wasn't afraid. Um, there was one time when I was in a helicopter and, and um, we, we were, we kind of got caught in the tail end of a typhoon and that was a little bit scary. But, you know, in, in terms of, of like, you know, going out, going out to visit these places and um, I, there wasn't anything that I think that we, we, meaning the you know, donut dollies really worried about a lot. I think it was, I think we just kind of compartmentalized that, you know, that was our, that was our job. That's what we signed on for. And like any job, you know, you get into a routine and you get into a schedule and you just, you just, you know, you go into work and that's your schedule for the day and you go and you go and do it. Did your parents think you were out of your mind to want to do this? Um, my parents were very were very cool about it. I have to say they um, because I didn't I didn't tell them uh, until after uh, I had had my interview with the Red Cross what what the options were. Um, I came back from the interview and my mother asked me how the interview had gone. I said I think it went pretty well. Um, you know I think I I'm probably going to get this job. And she said, Well, did they? did they uh, you know, tell you where, where you would go? And I said, well, I would have a choice between either Vietnam or Korea. And my mother said, well, that's not much of a choice. <laughs> uh, and so and I said to her, I'm, I'm gonna go to Vietnam. So, and she was, uh, she, was, she was very, very cool about it. She didn't try to say, I don't want you. I'm sure she didn't want me to go, but she, she never tried to like talk me out of it. She never said to me, oh, I don't want you to do that. You know, um, she, was, she was really great. Um, we're getting some questions and comments from the viewers. And one is, what game are you playing here? That would, well, that's a game that we made up that would probably some kind of little flashcards or something, um, you know, like Rose mentioned, we would, we always, we got our supplies in from, I think they came in from Japan or someplace, but, you know, we'd use a lot of just poster board and we, there were little games and quizzes. And a lot of times like we would, um, we would split the guys up into maybe two or three different groups and they were like playing against each other for, to, you know, for points and we would have a series of little, you know, contests or quizzes, a lot of, a lot of trivia type questions. Usually the programs had some kind of a, of a theme. Um, and so all of the, all of the games and all the activities were, um, you know, un, were things that would, that went along with the same theme, like maybe the wild west or geography or a history 
or um, like I did a program one time that was all about crime and I called it the Godfather game. And it was, it was had all these little quizzes and games about, you know, um, movie, like move, like criminal movies and um, just, just whatever, whatever we could think of. You know, we, we tend, when we think about the Vietnam War, we tend to think of it as one war and it, and it really wasn't. And it, it, it depended on where you served you know, whether you are in, in four core or I core, there's two very different wars, whether you're at sea or in riverboats or in the jungles or in the, you know, in the, in the uh, higher elevations. I mean, wherever you, whether you fought the Viet Cong or the NVA and also when you served, when Rose was there mm -hmm. in 1966, 1967, it was very much a different war than when you were there in 1970, 1971. By the time you got there, um, morale was really a problem in the army and you know the counterculture had already had really taken hold in this country, and a lot of the soldiers who got drafted had already been kind of converted by the counterculture, and so they had you know longer hair, and there were starting to be drug problems in the in the army. Um, did you get a sense of of that? Like, oh gosh, this is a, you know, this is a really a traumatized uh, group of men here. I mean, did you get a, a sense of um, kind of there being trouble? uh with the army well yes yes um you know much more so by by that time uh that of course i mean there there was still a draft back then and so by the and by that time uh a lot of these young men they you know had been had been drafted uh so they certainly were not there voluntarily i think any any um ideas uh you know that that uh, we were over there to uh you know to um, push back communism and you save the Vietnamese, the South Vietnamese people from, from that. I think, you know, that kind of idealism by that time was long gone. I think there was a great deal of resentment uh, and justifiably so uh, among, um, you know, the, the, the young soldiers um, who had to be there, who didn't have a choice. Um, and, uh, then that 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 certainly uh, was played out in in you know in in various different ways. Uh, when we certainly did encounter some of that more in the rear than out in the forward areas, because I think by that time the whole for for the whole thing was about you just you live through it, you know, you you get through it and do what you have to do to survive and come home and hopefully in in one piece. Um, and every day, that's every day was just about just survival. And, uh, and I think it was, it, it was, of course, very, you know, very, very difficult. Uh, and so we, we did have, it was, uh, we, it was a tough job uh, at times, uh, because it's, what we did sometimes, I, I often wonder what people would think when we talk about this, about how we would make up these silly little games, and we would carry them out there in these big canvas bags and we would just kind of come in on a on a in a truck or a helicopter or a jeep or whatever and and you know kind of set up our silly little games there and get some guys to come around and you know cluster around and agree to play these games you know uh it, it sounds so and i guess it was it sounds so primitive it's just it sounds so so basic but that's that's the way things were back then. It was just a um, you know just a just a um, it wasn't you know no 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 cell phones. I was no, going to say, were you able to bring your smartphones with you? You weren't allowed to bring your iPhones with you. Um, for the, for the for the most part, you know, doing doing what we can, to, just to bring bring a few smiles, have, you know, have a few laughs, and uh, have some a little bit of a diversion from. Um, from either the, the tension or in a lot of cases, especially back in the rear, it was just boredom. Boredom was the, was the big, you know, a, a big uh, factor there. That was yeah. kind of like the enemy. And that, Ellie and know, Libby, there, were, there was no the internet areas. back then, just so you know, Ellie and Libby. Um, we have, uh, a we have an onslaught of questions. I, just I know we do. Jump I, in and, here, but Larry well, just asked something pertinent, but there, I want to Go back. You can choose the one you want to start with, but yeah, I I've, do want to start with Ben Wright. Just uh, has a good question. Do you know the name of the donut dolly with you in this picture? Yes, her name was Vivian. And did you travel much with her? 
Yes, uh, she was uh, at Camp Eagle. She was our unit director when I, when I got there. So we had six girls in in that unit, and so and we all we, you know we would we would take turns. We weren't always with the same person, but you know we would we would alternate. But since this is something that we did, you know, every day, yeah. And Lauren, you said, I know Larry asked a question. Yeah, well, I think it's pertinent to identify, like um, Lucy commented, she had two tours in Korea and then she went on to Vietnam for with the special services for 20 months. Lucy's here with us. When I heard 20 months, I think of a recent deployment and those that are re redeployed, perhaps a deployment's nine or 12 months. But one special service trip for Lucy was 20 months long. I mean, I did 36 total or, you know, for however many in the Navy, that seems like an awful long tour. Um, long how, tour. how long did you spend in total? And was that the norm? I mean, like 20 months? Um, no, well, on the Red Cross, we had 12 month tours. So, and my, my tour in Vietnam was, was 12 months. There were, a, a, every once in a while, uh, there would be somebody who would extend for a month or three months or something like that. And uh, and, and I knew some other Red Cross workers who like Rose had came back later for a subsequent tour. Um, so I had 12 months in Vietnam and then um, I continued working for the Red Cross uh, after I came back to the States. I was at a Naval Hospital in Boston and um, was there for less than a year. And then I went back uh, for another tour as a donut dolly, but that time in Korea. And, and actually was in Korea for eight months. And that's when the, the SRAO program for donut dollies, that program was discontinued in March of 1973. So, um, okay. but a, a typical tour in Vietnam was, was 12 months. One of the great things about traveling Vietnam with you, Lori, is you had on your smartphone pictures that you had taken in uh -huh. Vietnam. And here we are, we visited uh, Khe Sanh. And I love this, uh, if people could see the, the screen, this is a photo up top of a photo uh, of a, a scene that you took, a picture that you took in 1970 or 71 at Khe Sanh. Yes. And down below is that same scene today that you took. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? It's just amazing. And you can tell because of the mountain, because that distinctive mountain around it. How, mm -hmm. how wonderful. And again, this is uh, Da Nang, I think, uh, Red Beach, uh, Da Nang, um, or China Beach, I should say. Uh, uh, maybe. And. Yeah. Or actually, I think the one on the top actually was Eagle Beach, which is near Way. Oh, that's the Eagle Beach near Way. Okay. Yeah. And this is us on that our trip. In, I think that that bottom one. Oh, oh, and that's in Saigon. Is the bottom one is China Beach? Yeah, the bottom one. I get. Yeah, because we did go to China Beach. Right. Yeah. And then here's the Presidential Palace that we visited. This is our group, um, and and a picture that you took then. I mean, it's just amazing the kinds of uh, places that you saw. You were all over the place uh, during your tour. And I'll ask you what I asked Rose. Um, like looking back, it sounds like you're glad you did it. Oh, I'm very glad. I think it's one of the best things I've best things I've ever done. Why? Well, I just it was it, it opened up the world for me because and you know and uh, I had I grew up in in Punxsutawney. That's where I'm from. And um, at the time that I joined the Red Cross, I had been to um, Ohio a couple of times, and I had been to um, Western New York. That was it. That was it. And so, you know, for me to then get this job and go halfway around the world to a completely different culture than anything that I had knew any, knew about or had ever experienced, it, it just opened up the world for me. And we were, uh, we were able to travel from Vietnam. We got an R&R &R, just like the soldiers did. So I got to go to uh, Sydney, Australia on my R&R, &R, and we also got uh, leave time. So I was able to travel to Hong Kong and Bangkok um, on leave. And on my way back, we also had the option of uh, taking a little detour along the way. And so I was able to go to Japan. Um, and, and it really opened up, a, it just opened up the world to me and and 
ignited a, a real love of travel, uh, which I still enjoy traveling to this day. Um, I lived in I lived five and a half years in Germany. Uh, we had two different two different tours there, and um, you know continue can continue to travel um, as much you know as, as much as we can. And um, I don't I don't know as I would have ever even gotten to do any of that if I hadn't made this. I made this. It's like I made one choice that just really. Um, impacted the whole trajectory of yes. my life. And I yes. have traded this experience for anything. Right, you were, you were going down this road and then you went to Vietnam and your life took a whole different turn. Mm -hmm. Just amazing to me. Um, I want to ask, I want to, oh, I want to ask a group question here and please do think about it. I don't know who might have the answer to this. Larry Jones has a wonderful question in the chat. And that is with, with the time that you spent in Vietnam, uh, do any of you, do, do you know anybody who has come down with presumptive illnesses associated with Agent Orange exposure? And I imagine, I'm imagining so. I'm imagining that was the case. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have, do we have Jenny Young? Jenny, are you? Yes, here we go. Hi, Jenny. You were the first to raise your hand. So I'm going to uh, spotlight you here. And can you unmute yourself? I, am I unmute now? Yeah, you are unmuted. Okay. And, I raised my hand immediately because I thought of two warnings. No, I shouldn't say warnings. Two ad advisories that we got at training in DC. One was to make sure not to handle any weapons because if we ever got photographed, it might be used to show that non-combatant uh, civilians were in violation of Geneva Conventions. So don't uh, handle weapons. And secondly, we might come across some World War II veterans who resent the fact that the Red Cross had to charge for coffee and cards and donuts in World War II at the behest and command, really, of the War Department. So we, they told us, watch out for the people that resent the Red Cross because of what mm -hmm. we wished we didn't have to do in World War II and then the weapon aspect. So I just wanted to mention those two things. They were very definitely planted in my head in DC. Jenny, I am so glad that you brought up both those things because they're so important. Don't handle weapons because it could be used as propaganda you know, against the US. And the second is you were fighting still in the 1960s against this uh, just bad reputation that the Red Cross had coming at with GIs, with American GIs, coming out of World War II. And that bad reputation is the result of this decision uh, that was made, that was really forced upon the Red Cross in 1942 to begin charging like two cents per donut. Um, and, and, that, and it that, Excuse me, for that, but that continues today. I was doing a presentation uh, just a year or two ago and uh, someone in the audience who was my age said that her father instructed her never donate to the Red Cross because of what happened to her father. And she came up to me afterwards to say, I always wondered why my dad felt that way. And you just clarified the situation and she understood. Absolutely. And we have, I know, at least one World War veteran with us today, tonight. And that is Roland Glenn and Jenny. I'm going to come back to you because I want to share a picture. But I just want to ask Roland um, if if you remember the Red Cross in World War II and what reputation did the Red Cross have? I, re I remember them very very well. After the atom bombs and after the slaughter of Okinawa, and after the Japanese had been moved back to Japan, uh, I was located in Chengdu. Korea, and um, an amazing thing happened. Uh, three young women arrived and identified themselves as Red Cross girls. And um, it was uh, Jean, Elaine, and Anne. And we uh, officers almost went mad, uh, hoping that we would be able to date these attractive young women and we put up a, a big Quonset hut and they opened up a canteen for the GIs. I don't remember the, the issue of 
being uh, having the GIs charged for donuts. Maybe maybe that was the case. But this was the fall of 1945, and the Christmas was upon us, and there were no trees in Korea. Every single green leaf had been cut down, and we all needed a Christmas tree. And my buddy Jim took one of the sheets off of our bed and nailed it on the wall and went to the motor pool and got a can of green paint and painted the Christmas tree. And uh, Jean and Elaine and Anne went and got their lipsticks and drew Christmas decorations on the Christmas tree. And we had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas Eve with them. Uh, Jim and I continued a friendship with Anne and, and Jean after the war. And uh, Jean attended my wedding and uh, we had uh, a number of years following getting back uh, to have to sustain that friendship. It was just simply wonderful. The guys adored these women. Uh, they were just, uh, it was just fantastic. It really was. Oh, what a great story and a great memory. And I, I do want to uh, clarify just as a historian um, about the this reputation problem with the Red Cross in World War II, because it still is studied in business school today as a brand disaster. <laughs> it really was a brand disaster. And here's how here's what happened: uh, the uh, American GIs began arriving in England, preparing for the Normandy invasion, and there was a British Red Cross, and the British Red Cross charged regular British soldiers for don donuts and coffee. And Americans were getting that for free. And that was rankling relations between the British and the Americans. The British soldiers were resenting that the Americans were getting the donuts and coffee for free. So the War Department over the Red Cross's, um, uh, what's the word, over their, you know, uh, best, you know, intent, um, the War Department forced the Red Cross to charge two cents per donut and a similar charge per coffee. And I believe, Roland, I hate to say this, I think they only charged enlisted men. I think <laughs> officers, and you were an officer, uh, got it for free, and that just doubled the resentment. And so that's why when we started having Veterans Breakfast Club events back in 2008, and we had a lot of World War II veterans attending, they would get up and just rail still against the Red Cross. And it took me a while to get to the root of this resentment. but. You know, it turns out GIs, when they're overseas, they're touchy about things like that. And uh, boy, so it took the Red Cross a, a long time to get over that. Jenny, I'm going to bring you back up because I want to show your picture. Yeah, what do you think about that? I don't see. Oh, yeah. You Did don't I think send that in? I don't remember. <laughs> is that you? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you. And so that's you as a, as a Red Cross volunteer in 1968, 69? Yes. Oh, my gosh. What was your impression when you landed in Vietnam? Same well, as Lori and Rose? I, I was born and raised in the St. Louis area. So St. Louis is known for its hot, hot, humid, humid summers. So I didn't have uh, the extreme reaction to the heat and humidity that other people did. Because I'd been raised in it. And your job was very similar to the, them? You, you, you traveled the country? Yes. I want to commend Rose on being such a good spokesperson for who we were, what we did, and everything. That was excellent, Rose. I really appreciate it. You really described it for us all. Thank you. Were you warned not to fraternize with the uh, servicemen? No. We were okay. I'm just asking. I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm not, you know. Oh, look at these great pictures. You were allowed to fraternize with a puppy, though, I guess, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's so By great. the way, we, we were told never to ask the names of the dogs out on the fire bases because they could be very off color. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure you heard a lot of off color things in your in your uh, time in Vietnam. Um, oh man, 
Uh, let's see who else we have here. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you for uh, not, we have Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Let's uh, spotlight you here. How are you doing? Let's see if we can unmute you here. Okay, there we go. How are you doing, Elizabeth? I'm, I'm doing fine. I'm just like everybody else, we're staying home, trying to stay safe. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'm just so grateful that um, uh, that we could have do events like this, you know, when we can't get together mm -hmm. in oh, person. Yeah. This is a nice, a nice substitute. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show a picture of you because I want you to give a little bit of history. Um, this is you at a very important grave site in Normandy. Ah, uh, yes. Um, this and, and this was just a couple of years ago. Every time um, I visit, um, I, I travel a lot. And because I've been with the Red Cross for many, many years, every time I um, visit a grave site, a military grave site, um, I, I look for the Red Cross markers. And this one was pointed out to me by the, the, the guide even be, before I had looked. And um, she had told the, or he had told the story. He was a local guide. Um, and he had told the, the story of uh, Nancy Reagan visiting this, this um, for a D-Day celebration and had wanted to, to visit this, this site because this was the, the one woman that she had heard of that had died and she had been a, a Red Cross person. So she right. had come without cameras or without fanfare and just come and laid um, flowers on this, this grave and so on. And I always do too. Yeah. Whenever I, I visit a, a military grave site, I go look for the Red Cross one and, uh, and always put flowers on it. So. Paying tribute to the, your predecessor exactly. with the Red Cross. Exactly. L let me ask you, um, why did you join? Well, I was actually, as you can probably tell, I'm, you know, I'm not Native, Native American. I, I was born um, in the UK and raised in the UK, and I used to be a British Red Cross nurse. And when I married an American and came over here, the Red Cross was the familiar uh, to me. And so, you know, I wanted to be a part of it. My husband worked for the Department of Defense, and we were stationed overseas, and um, I joined service to the armed forces. But at that time, I wasn't mobile. Um, I later became mobile. And it was very different to, to the way I love to listen to all these stories. It's very different um, to, to the way these ladies uh, talk about being the, the donut dollies. It was something that we, we applied for the job. And when we applied for the job, we applied knowing that we would be mobile and that we had to go wherever we were assigned. We were not allowed to turn down an assignment. And we went to military bases and we were also de deployed along with the, the troops to deployment sites. And how did your work differ from what you heard? And I'm, I'll show a picture oh, of you is. here. This is you, Kosovo. Um, how did your work here you know, in the 1990s differ from what we've heard from Jenny and Rose and Lori? Um, a little bit. I mean, this this picture here was in Kosovo, in uh, that was my first de de deployment, and it was a little bit different than there. There were some things that that were the the same. We did a little bit of the um, fun things. We we had one. We we were camp on steel. We had a tent on the top of a hill. In fact, it was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen in my life when we first arrived. We were supposed to go to Albania, and uh, when the troops moved up, and we realized that if we'd arrived in Albania, there wasn't going to be any any military there. So we we moved on on up, and we went to Macedonia, and then to to Kosovo. And we we went while we were there. They at the top of the hill, and you arrived, and you saw all the tanks in a circle, and just like the Indians used to. You know, <laughs> Just like the, the oh, like yeah wagon circle or whatever they call it circle yeah there. and and we, we we thought that was fascinating and they built this town which was absolutely amazing they built the base in between where all these these tanks had been on top of the hill and so that's when I arrived and there was a lot of mud and um, very little 
everything was brown and dark and very dingy and there'd been a you know a lot of scarring of the countryside things had right. been burned and it was an active war zone so and and we lived in a tent and what did you do i mean what was your mission we um we had a canteen in the tent but the main mission was the emergency communications getting um if something happened back home and they needed soldiers back fast, we would we would get the message, we get verified, it would come to us, right. and we would notify the command, and then the, the command, um, and sometimes with, with our help, um, right. got the, the military out fast. So. And this is you in 2003 getting ready for deployment to Iraq? Right. Wow. Uh, and, that's, and I went I went back to Kosovo in 2002, 2003, and was pulled from um, Kosovo to go to Iraq. So I went back to back to deployments, one right right after the other. And um, so I went from the freezing cold into the yes. terribly <laughs> Yes, definitely. It was a huge day. And so you were there just shortly after the invasion. Actually, I was I was there very. In fact, I was the only this. I was part of the second team that went in. The first team traveled in with the military, and they wow. were there a couple of weeks, and and we replaced them. We were still living in, um, actually, Saddam Hussein's um, VIP terminal at uh, Baghdad at, International Airport. At the airport. Yeah. And your your mission here was it pretty much similar to what you had done in Kosovo, or had it, it changed was, by then? Well, what had changed by then is that um, at that time we there wasn't a lot of communications. There, there, there were, you know, there was a morale was was really poor. They'd gone into um, into Baghdad, and they were told that once they that the road home was through Baghdad, but then they didn't go home. Yeah. So. And, and we, we, we stayed with them. We were in, in that terminal. There was nothing. They couldn't talk to their loved ones. There were no cell phones there for them. They were not allowed to use cell phones at that time. There was, we had one green, and I know a lot of your, um, a lot of your military vets here would know those old green phones that you call yes. up on, yeah. that you, you say hello and you have to wait five minutes before hello comes back at you they had one of those phones that they put in and allowed soldiers to use and it was mostly soldiers allowed soldiers to use in in our facility there so we could keep track of who was using the the phones and then they started putting in extra phones um so they could use them so it was and the lines to use these phones in the wow. evening when the when the military came back from their um, from their you know from being out outside the the gate was amazing amazingly long they would sometimes wait all night just to be able to have a five minute phone call so elizabeth this is really interesting because you know we've had veterans who were part of that iraq war invasion uh in 2003 come on and tell their stories i haven't heard much i haven't heard many vets say however about how low the morale was i think with the passage of time um, but you know, you tend to remember the good and, and forget the bad. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting to hear from your perspective that morale was bad. I mean, it, they, they thought that they would be going home after taking Baghdad and it turns out it was just the beginning of a very long war. Right. Um, uh, and you were there from the very beginning. And so did these kind of servicemen and women really, they were looking to connect with home, to contact home. Right. And, and I think once once the communications improved and once as you know, as the the infrastructure was was built up and and that always amazes me yes. how quickly the military just just builds. And um, once once that started, then people people started getting out feeling a little bit happier. Yes. Oh, how interesting. But it, it, it was it was really, really, really hard on, on some of them at, at the beginning. And how did it differ in 2005? And here you are at Fob Danger on the 4th of July. I yeah. love this picture. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, well, well by, by now we were doing a little bit more. When we were, when I first went in, into Iraq, it was extremely hard because we, um, all we could do was messages. We just had one message after the other. It was, we sat there for 12 hours, just constantly communicating, calling on these, these dreadful phones, you know, and, 
And um, so we didn't have time to do anything else. In fact, I was there at Christmas and I remember um, sitting there and, and thinking, oh my goodness, it's Christmas day. And I went, went out into the, the terminal where we had a whole bunch of, of soldiers sitting and I put on um, reindeer antlers <laughs> and I said, and I said, Merry Christmas. And, and they, they were, they were laughing at me and, and said, well, you know, they, a lot of them were yelling, well, heads, heads up reindeer. And, you know, is it hunting season yet? And, you know, then it sort of, for about five minutes, they were all, oh yes, it's Christmas. So it was, you know, it, it, it was hard, but of course, by the 4th of July, then we were doing a few more things with MWR. We were, we used to do some fun things with the military, but um, usually MWR took that. But the first teams in were the ones that didn't have MWR. So we would right. work with them, like when I was first in Kosovo and we, uh, we were there for the millennium. And I was- You were the MWR and I just will tell the viewers- You were the MWR. Yes, that's what that, I would just tell our viewers who don't know what that is. That's, hold it. Morale, welfare, welfare recreation, recreation, right? That's military speak for morale, welfare, recreation. Right. And usually an MWR club will come in, but at first mm -hmm. that's that's what you were doing is, yeah. yeah. That's what we were doing. And uh, when when that happened, I um, we used to go for lanes training too, which I think might be a little bit different to, to the, the Donut Nollies in Vietnam. We used to have to train with the military. We used to have to do the rolling around in the dirt and the I'm up, you know, he sees me, I'm down and and, and all that that training for, for a whole week be, before we left. And um, while I was out there, I met up with a um, an engineering group. And I said, look, we're going to be out there for the millennium. I said, do you think you could build a ball that we could drop, you know, just like in New York? And they said, oh, sure, we can do that. We're engineers, we can build everything. And, and I said, okay. And I don't think they thought that they would ever see me again. But uh, when we arrived in, in Kosovo and I realized that the engineer tent was just, just down the road, I went down and said, hey, remember me? You remember I talked about making a ball for, for the millennium? And they said, uh, Oh yes, well, we're not sure. We're really busy and we're not quite sure this. I said, oh, come on, please, please, please. And we, we went back and forth and this took on a life of its own and the general found out about it and thought it would be a wonderful idea. So of course they made a beautiful ball out of um, nothing and put fairy lights on it. And then we were struck with, well, how on earth are we gonna drop it at midnight? And they um, said, well, and I saw a big crane and I went up to the person with the crane and I said, do you think you could drop a ball <laughs> at midnight <laughs> on the millennium? And they, they said, sure, we can do that. So we wheeled the crane into, into place there. And the general did, gave the countdown five, four, he said five, four, and then the ball just dropped like it. <laughs> like a rock <laughs> like a rock and, and five four three two one and it opened up and it said happy millennium from your american red cross and the army corps of engineers so see and elizabeth that is so neat that's such a neat little glimpse into the into what your mission was i mean anybody who is there for that remembers that i'm sure I and know. it's just like a little bit of levity you know in a in a situation that could be scary and lonely and yes, you know scary. how wonderful and you know we have maybe 10 minutes left or so. And I know that we have other people, Red Cross volunteers here in the room with us. Um, and I want to invite them to, you know, if they want to raise their hand and say, oh, Peggy, you have your hand raised. Here we go. Let's spotlight you. How are you, Peggy? But I, I mentioned that um, my mother-in-law was an army nurse in Korea and her roommate was someone from the Red Cross. So that uh, that was special, especially at the um, at the memorial or when the wall was built and my husband was in Brezhnev's funeral overseas and my mother-in-law and I went to all the hospitality suites and no other mother-in-law would go with her daughter-in-law to visit all these guys in every single hotel room. So they <laughs> share, especially with the World War II vet. 
And I, after I, I, I like to call a lot of us stale donuts because after Vietnam, I worked for the Red Cross in West Virginia, in Pittsburgh area. Pittsburgh was like heaven in 1971, um, visiting from Wheeling. And then I got a job with the special services in, in Germany. So I always would call all the girls who ended up doing that, we called ourselves stale donuts. And we did the same type of job. And the girl that uh, one of the old timers said, if you like Vietnam, you'll love Grafenvier, Germany, because it was Seventh Army Training Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, but in in Vietnam, I'm from Rochester, New York, but I remember I was one of the few northern gales uh, at the time. And uh, we were usually transferred three times a year and, and the unit sponsored us, the 25th Division or the 31st Tactical Fighter Wing. And in some places we did have um, a physical building, but when we didn't, it was club mobile. So I was glad we had, I had two club mobiles. And my, um, it was the best year of my life and it prepared me for being a foreign service spouse. So I spent a lot of time overseas in less than ideal places. And right. I know that being in the Red Cross in Vietnam was the best thing. And I felt sorry for the guys who were drafted. I thought we're not doing anything and we should. And I had two cousins over there, uh, one with the 199th and he was, he came back right before I left and another one was wounded. And I visited my wounded cousin at Fort Devens when he uh, was recovering. Wow. I don't want to take a lot of time because I no, know- No, no, Peggy, I want to ask you, so you felt an obligation to serve because, because, you know, people in your family were drafted, you knew neighbors who were drafted maybe? thought it was so unfair that it, I went to State University at Albany, history poli sci major, and I, and I thought, you know, they're all being drafted. And I did go on peace marches when I was in college, because this is what some of us did. And I thought, I want to see what it's like over there. And I, you can go to so many peace marches, but you want to do something to help in your own way. So... I am so impressed by that, Peggy. It's just, you know, I mean, that that's youth right there. That is, you know, most of us, like, you know, you read the paper, you watch TV, you see something bad happening over the other side of the world. You say, oh, that's terrible. But you don't think about going there to see it in person. You did. Well, it was a 21 hour flight. <laughs> um Wake from San Francisco to Hawaii to Wake Islands to the Philippines, and there was incoming in Saigon. So instead of a very short stay at Clark Air Force Base, we stayed a little longer. And someone said, Let's go to the Airmen's Club, which we all did. And then everyone said, We're not supposed to drink in uniform. And then someone said, Who is going to see us? <laughs> sipping San Miguel beer. And then we got into, uh, we left the States on a Sunday morning and we got to um, Vietnam at three o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday. And we were just in, in Saigon one day and then we got on a C-130. Wow, you see one thirty, and you're off for the to the races. You're God, off Peggy's your answering questions from that she doesn't even know exists. Eric, uh, when did you know how long was the flight back then? And you said twenty one hours, right? Um, and Todd, what I hear you you pointed out. I'm sorry to butt in, but this is another no, question from the in. audience: is that um, do you get a flag when you're buried? What are your benefits and the recognition <laughs> of someone who serves? Because um, it seems to me that there's that calling, that 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 sense of like. I, my least favorite question is why did you join the Navy? I'm like, I don't know. It was like, I, I was a kind of like an innate uh, pulling or, or a sense. And it, I heard that with you, Peggy. So I think you should have the same designation, you know, um, with benefits and things. And a question from the audience is, do you get a flag upon burial and do you get recognition for your service? The one nice thing I 
we are recognized is that uh, women in the memorial and women in the military memorial and my mother-in-law is registered there i made sure she was and i'm also registered and that's one of the best things to do you uh you write your story, you're on the computer, you can show it to your grandkids and they go, wow. And, uh, and, and that's right at Arlington. So I always try to encourage people to do that. And that's one of the things that we can be part of. Oh, Peggy, you know, I don't say this very often, but thank you for your service. <laughs> and wow. thank you for coming on and kind of sharing just a little bit of the story. This is such an enlightening educational uh, session. I, I appreciate that so much. I know we have other donut dollies too, and we're left to just a couple minutes left in the program. Uh, can uh, we put on a, any troop or Marine or a service member who had an experience yes. with a donut dolly? Because when we had that last yeah, year, let's do that. Tearful exchange and not to put anyone on the spot, but it was so moving and I would hope that we could experience that. If you want to thank a donut dolly, now is your chance. <laughs> George, George Kniss. George, do you remember donut dollies? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're no, off. <laughs> we never had them. Yet, when I was there in the early part of Vietnam, we didn't have the USO. We did not have donut dollies. <laughs> We only had ladies of the night. Okay. <laughs> right. That's a whole nother program. That's right. a whole nother program. Stop Zoom bombing <laughs> us. Let's look at a flip through to Jim Roberts or Ken <laughs> Ricky. For real. It's a whole nother program, George. All right. <laughs> Let's do that program. <laughs> yeah, I, we will do that program. But Betsy, you are a donut dolly. Um, we have uh, Connie, were you? Ava, I have your pictures. Lauren, we're going to have to do another one of these programs. I let's think you're right, Todd. let's yeah. coordinate and let's do this again, a, a part two, because I find these stories really inspiring and really fascinating. Uh, what you're what you're giving me in many ways is a perspective on the Vietnam veterans who tell their stories at our events. Uh, you were there in them and among them, but you weren't a part of them. You were you were you know serving them. And so you have a perspective on them and their state of mind and, and what they needed and what they liked and didn't like uh, in a way that I think even the vets themselves can't explain. So I, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your service. Um, and um, uh, thank you for coming on today. And, and Betsy, how about if you and I coordinate and Elizabeth Shirk coordinate another one of these sessions? Um, and, I'd want uh, to go into five minute overtime to at least introduce them. <laughs> That's <laughs> okay. We'll do a five minute overtime to, to introduce them. How about we, how about, here's what we'll do. We always love to close out with, um, with Ermgard, uh, Ermgard leading us in song here. So how about if we do a song and then come back and have a little bit of a happy hour? Uh, I know that I just happen to have a beer with me up here, uh, up in my attic studio. So uh, we could do uh, uh, some overtime chat, informal conversation. And, um, but let's, let's have Ermgard go and close us out for those who want to leave us. And then we could come back and do a little happy hour. For everyone, this is Ermgard Ryan. She was born and raised in Germany. She grew up during World War II. Uh, she has a remarkable, wonderful, harrowing World War II story that she has shared with us. She ended up marrying an American GI and coming to the US and she brought an accordion with her and she likes to play uh, uh, some traditional German drinking songs. Isn't that right, Ermgard? Well, hello everybody. Great stories tonight. I really love you brave women. You deserve a star on your forehead forever. But I, yes, I grew up in Germany, but tonight I have a different song. I'm gonna please you. Most of my songs are old sing-along, old German songs. The one tonight, I found the history back to 1700. And that version has 21 verses, don't worry. Oh. I'm not gonna bore you with them. I would sing the first verse only, and that's also in the 1792 version. And it talks about a young, Hussar, which I believe you would call cavalry, a soldier on a horse, 
while he was stationed in a little town, fell in love with this girl. Oh, he promised her. He loved her for a week, for a hundred days, for a whole year. He's going to love her forever. However, when I go through the 21 verses, when he went to the other town, he found another one. He made the same promise. So I'm going to sing the first word of Es war einmal ein treuer Hussar. There once was a true a cavalry man. He loved his girl forever and ever and whatever. I already told you. Let's see. Es war einmal ein treuer Hussar. Der liebt sein Mädchen ganzes Jahr. Now you have time for your whatever. Thank you, Ermgard. And Ermgard, don't leave because I have a question for you, okay? Okay. All right. So see you, everyone. If you want to leave, you can feel free to leave. We're going to hang out here for another 10 minutes or so. Uh, and just uh, 15 minutes and have a have an informal conversation and a happy let me, hour. Let me butt in and say, if you want to leave, but you don't know how, there's a red button. If you hover your mouse over, um, bottom right, it says leave. Because it's so that if you don't know how, now you know. Or you could pull the plug out of the wall. Or yeah, just unplug us. <laughs> shut down your computer, close like your laptop, laptop, turn off your phone, however you want to do it. I, I want to make sure that we get all the the names of the other um, Donut Dollies, the Red Cross volunteers who were with us tonight. Lucy, I'm gonna unmute you. Lucy Davidson. Lucy was the one who wrote that amazing comment about two Red Cross tours in Korea, went to Vietnam with uh, special services for 20 months. Like I was mentioning earlier, I just that's just a ton of service, and I'm I'm still trying to get to the bottom of whether they're recognized um, by the government for their service, okay. civilian service or not. Connie, were you? Uh... Oh no, Connie. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. I was in Vietnam in uh, 1969, uh, 70, so I was sort of later than most of the people you've been talking with. And I was stationed uh, with the Air Force in um, Cameron um, Air Force Base. And then I spent six months there and then went to um, Da Nang and I was with the Marines and I was there about four months. And then I ended up in Benoit um, near Saigon. And I was there for four months. I did extend for one uh, month. And I was struck by what Lori said about, and I had never heard anyone say this, so it, it really made me feel like I wasn't crazy, but I also felt like Lori that we were, there was another war and it was a war of boredom. And um, that's what I felt like with camera on air, we had in uh, two recreation centers. And then in Da Nang, we had a big one. And then in um, oh Benoit, we had a small one. So I am sort of um, very different than most of the donut dollies, I think, in Vietnam, because I love the centers. And I love going out, yes, to the club mobiles. But my niche was the recreation centers. So thank you very much for inviting us. So Connie, what is your last name? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, first name is Connie. Um, my uh, maiden name in Vietnam was Dugan, D-U-J-A-N. Oh, excuse me, D-U-G-A-N. And then my married name is Popel, Pope with an L, P-O-P-E-L. Okay. Go. So thank Got you it. very much for having Connie, us. Connie, thank you. That's terrific. Now, you went from an Air Force base to the Marines. Yes, and then to the Army. And that, that must have been a terrible transition. You should have gone the other way. <laughs> because we were so spoiled. We I know, that's what I'm saying. I know. I know. China Beach, we were spoiled. We <laughs> were on Bay to, oh my gosh, yeah. And then bam. <laughs> And I know we have Ava Martin. Ava, 
I'm going to unmute you here. How are you, Ava? Yeah. Hey, hey, Ava. <laughs> and, well, my experiences were a little different. Actually, um, when I graduated from college and my degree in recreation, my local, I had been involved with my local chapter and done all kinds of, was swimming and, and was an instructor and stuff. And they told me about the programs. And when I went for my interview, I could either do SRAO or go to um, military hospitals. And at that point, um, I decided to go to the military hospital, and so I dealt with a lot of the the salt, the, well, the Navy hospital, so a lot of the sailors and Marines coming back from Vietnam, and the hospital I was at was um, the, um, the Navy hospital in Oakland, California, and that was the amputee center for the Navy at that point, so, um, so that's kind of how I started my career, but I ended up... Uh, my passion for working with, I came from the military family, military, that I had a 40 year career with also, uh, working with the military and serving in the forces and have continued to volunteer with the Red Cross. So, my, mine has been a life experience of, of what I've done. So. Well, I, w I know I have photos of you, Ava, and I want to have another program so I could show them and have you talk, talk about it a bit and kind of walk us through uh, your career a bit. Joyce, were you also uh, Donna Dolly? Let me unmute you here. Okay, you may have to unmute yourself. Okay. There you go. Okay, I was stateside during the Vietnam era. I served with the Red Cross as a service to military family social worker, doing oh. those MCROS calls for health and welfare. And, and what was that kind of job? What did you do? You were with families who had members who were overseas in Vietnam and elsewhere? Yes, that's in the Boston area. In the so Boston I dealt area. with verifications for whatever with the illnesses, deaths, uh, baby announcements, health and welfare inquiries when folks had not heard from their families. So it was pretty much dealing with families. Dealing with military families. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Joyce. Um, I want to, how about uh, Betsy? You can unmute yourself there. There you go. Yeah, um, the other ones, you, the Kalevas uh, have volunteered, each one is, each of them has volunteered for 50 years with the American Red Cross. So don't forget the Leslie and Nars. I was with the SRA program in Vietnam also uh, 68, 69 with two club mobile units. And I'm currently president of the American Red Cross Overseas Association as of four weeks ago. So that's why I was able to coordinate with Todd after Elizabeth let me know that Todd had gotten in touch with her about uh, having this program. So we will be easily be able to invite any of the 400 members of our COA, if you really want. To. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is so interesting to me. And I think it's a history that, you know, a lot of people don't know about. And it, not only a history, but something that's still going on. The Red Cross is still serving. And um, so it's fascinating to me, Betsy. Thank you for getting the word out. You're welcome. Well, let's do this again. Okay. Very good. Um, and so, uh, Leslie and Nars. Okay, Nars is, hi, everybody. Uh, Nars had to go. He has another call. <laughs> He's on. Um, my husband was actually paid staff and in Vietnam, boots on the ground with the donut guys, but he was one of those uh, in charge of the stations passing the messages and things. And I was married to somebody else back then uh, during Vietnam but uh, to, a, to an army man. And when I'm asked by these wonderful women who were boots on the ground, uh, what did you do and who were you assigned with? Well, I was assigned at the Red Cross stations and I wasn't assigned, I was a volunteer and I was doing casework. So when those case messages got to Vietnam, I was the one on the state side working them or when we went to Germany, working those cases back and forth. And, um, you know, the fascination of being able to help the families of arguing with landlords when they got 
when, when these young families came back to a very high cost area in New Jersey and us arguing and fighting with the landlord saying, please waive the deposit fees, please do what you can. So yeah. it was a very different world that we did. Um, I guess I'm still serving our Vietnam veterans right now because I have the privilege in the position I'm with with Red Cross right now is we host the um, the memorial services at the National Cemetery here in Winchester, Virginia. And so on Vietnam Veterans Memorial Day, I work with them closely to put on our ceremonies and work with those guys and gals. And, um, you know, it was our war. And, uh, you know, it, it is wonderful that we can still carry on with our with the with those who served and still remain, you know, I give them service still. And, and next time get Nars to tell all his stories about Vietnam. <laughs> yeah, you bet. And Lucy, I know you're unmuted. I can't see you. And I think that's Marie Lucy Davidson. Uh, I think you're, the re you're a remaining Red Cross personnel. Um, also, Jenny Close and Dorothy Baum. Yes. And but Jim Lucy said she can see us, but she's an old computer without a camera. So Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Get a new one before the next program, Lucy. That's all I ask. All right. Todd, uh, she said, will you foot the bill? <laughs> Are you okay with that? <laughs> You're like Rick the Jeep guy. Rick the Jeep guy. And <laughs> I see your shoulder. Good to see you. You had to. You didn't run across any donut dollies when you were in Vietnam, Rick, with the Marines? I got to uh, Vietnam in 1966. I was one of the early uh, early drafts that arrived there. The things were so confused. It was uh, it was not the organized Marine Corps that I left behind. Got it. When I landed there, it was uh, it was chaos, and uh, I may have occasionally seen a Caucasian woman, but it would have been so rare that it would have been remarkable. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. Hey, Todd. Yeah. I've got a question for the uh, Donut Dollies who went to Vietnam during that time when it, there were a lot of protests at home. Uh, what did people think about you going there? And when you came home, how were you treated when you came home? Good question. Wonderful question. Anybody care to answer? I will. Okay, for next. Yes, yeah, sure. Lori, Betsy, chime in. Um, well, when, when I came home, um, there had been articles in the local newspaper when I went to Vietnam, and there was an article about me while I was there. And so uh, when I came home, uh, I was asked to speak at a number of different organizations. And um, there was a, it was a small town and uh, there was a lot, actually a lot of interest, um, people wanting to know, um, you know, what it was like and what I had been doing. So um, there was, there, there wasn't anything, nothing negative. I didn't get any kind of negative reactions um, from anyone um, when I came home. But I think part of that was because nobody, people didn't know, people didn't know about us. You know, I, I, I traveled home in my Red Cross uniform, and which I think is what we were supposed to do, which is probably what, you know, why, why I did that. But I traveled all the way home through San Francisco into Pittsburgh wearing my Red Cross uniform. And uh, nobody would have, nobody would have even, you know, thought, uh, maybe wondered, well, what, you know, why is she wearing that uniform or something like that. But um it, it, this the program was it just really wasn't um, wasn't really known about back here back in the states. Betsy, I was I grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, and then um, went to college in Atlanta, Georgia, and I got a job in Atlanta three months after I returned. So. Pretty much in Knoxville, I kept a pretty low profile. When I got to Atlanta, we ended up with a what we called our Donut Dolly halfway house. We had uh, f at least five different Donut Dollies rented a house together at different times in Atlanta. So we had our own support group. We 
all swore off men for a cup for at, at you know, I'm gonna say a couple of years. We'd seen enough men. We were yeah. getting people to get on, you know, pick a career path, start working with that. And That's how I felt when I got out of the Navy. <laughs> yeah. That's so, yeah, um, I get it. By having the support group and then anyone who came to Atlanta, we would take them to underground Atlanta and show them around. We had a lot of people that were traveling after they returned that we, none of us, well, I guess two of us that lived together, served together, but otherwise we just by word of mouth found each other. So we had a lot of post SRAO Vietnam people coming through and a couple of Korea people uh, would come through and stay with us when they were traveling. So um, that was our great, it was a really good support group to be able to have those people, uh, you know, to, we didn't really relive any of our experiences, but we all had understood what each other had been through. And so we were a pretty cohesive group. We had the same values and ideals and experiences under our belts. Like veterans. Yeah. I mean, it's just the same that, you know, that camaraderie. I was on a flight from uh, San Francisco and it was a red eye the night before Thanksgiving and every single person in the airport looked like a GI I had known, but I got on the flight and I was sitting next to a guy I went to college with who had flunked out of law school, ended up getting drafted and he was in the signal corps in Thailand. So while everyone else is sleeping, we talked all the way from San Francisco to Chicago to Rochester. And that day, Thanksgiving, the only person I could talk to at this big family dinner was my cousin who had been in Vietnam the year before. Wow. And then the year, and, that, and then I worked for the Red Cross in Wheeling, and I was going to every rotary, elk, moose, talking about the Red Cross that whole year. I was a youth director, but the other job was promoting the Red Cross. But um, once I got to Germany, I was working with a gal I had worked with in, in uh, Vietnam, Dolly. Her real name, Dolly Hasselwander from Enid, Oklahoma. And we were together in Tuiwa, and then we're together in Grafenbeer, Germany. So that it just, it was like uh, Betsy said, you needed a support group um, that, it, who understood what you went through. Mm -hmm. So Peggy, you were at Tuiwa. First, first assignment was Tuiwa Club, which was a, a building. It was, we had the Armed Forces rec, uh, radio station right next to our office. They talked us into doing a little request show on our day off and then from and that was the monsoon season it was 69 November 69 and it would rain and rain and rain and then I transferred to Coochie and followed the monsoons down <laughs> wherever you went it rained <laughs> monsoons in the south were nothing like up north uh up north it was cold it was 75 degrees and cold right and we have a veteran, Larry Woods, who was at Tui Watt in when you were there in 1969. He was on the show. He, he left. That would have been interesting to have you compare notes. Um, Bob Mizwa, you never saw Donut Dollies? Todd, for part two, can we do Larry and Betsy? Because that's such an that's, interesting. Or Larry and Peggy. Peggy, I'm sorry. Yeah, Linus Definitely. is being a troublemaker, and there's a bunch Linus. of people in my neighborhood doing a fundraiser or something. They're all hey, coming hey, along. Bob, so. <laughs> the only donut dollies I saw at one time when I was in Quang Tree, you know, our uh, armor company, we they pulled us back for our maintenance. So I got a haircut. I walk out of getting a haircut. Here's a bunch of donut dollies on the back of something, you know, and a swarm of guys around them, you know. <laughs> Bees around the honey hives. <laughs> so that was my only encounter. But I noticed Lori said she was at Quezon the same time I was in that area. You know, on, and that was Dewey Canyon 2, Lawson 719. Yes. Yes. That was it. That's exactly what it was, Dewey Canyon 2. Yeah. So, Lori, what month were you in Quezon? You remember? Uh, well, let's see. I got to Camp Eagle in January. 
So it would have been um, January, February time frame. Okay, because I was uh, at that time the support platoon leader, and then I got my tank platoon, which I and it wound up going to Quezon, and then eventually onto the Laotian border. And geez, if I would have known that, I could have taken you out on a date on my tank, you know, <laughs> old Charlie Thirty Three, and could have given you some of that wonderful tropical dark chocolate that everybody hated except for me and one other guy in a platoon. We got to split it all the time. <laughs> You narrowly escaped that fate, Lori. Congratulations! You would have, uh, <laughs> you would have, um, you would have recognized those big sunglasses right away. You'd remember those if you saw those great oh, sunglasses Lori was the, wearing. The only woman I saw in case on is like they pulled us out of Van Grift, and as we we're going by case on, we just stopped, and the one reporter from Paris Match Magazine, she was down on the ground. She wanted to ride on my tank down to the Laotian border, and I gave her a piece of my mind. Thank God she didn't go with us because oh, we went into a lot of crap. Wow. She would have got blown off my tank. Yeah. You know, but, uh, and I can't remember her name. She's a really attractive young lady too. I know yeah. who you're talking about. I know the reporter you're talking about. Yeah, she had that flowing brown curly hair, you know? Yes, yes. I, I have to I have to think about it a little bit, but I, I think she was covered at a museum that we went to in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. this is fantastic. Any other, Jenny, do you still have your, uh, your hand raised from earlier? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say I'm a Tuiwa as well. You were there also. also. Tuiwa. I opened the unit there. That's mm -hmm. interesting. Boy, yeah, we have to get Larry with you because Larry was. Sure, yeah, that's probably the picture of the Kool-Aid was probably at Tuiwa. It was Tuiwa. Um, I think you're right. I hadn't even put that connected. Yeah. Line, remember that? <laughs> that is so neat. How great. Hey, uh, I want to ask uh, Dan Vaughn if he remembers any donut dollies. I know you're there, Dan and Cheryl. We can't see you, but I know you're there. I'm pretty sure Jim Roberts was the one at the conference last year yeah. when the ladies came here. Is he still with us? Is he still here tonight? Um, he's, he's not here. On. He's yeah. not on tonight, but we'll have to get him on the next time. All right. Anything else to share for the good of the order? <laughs> oh, Ermgard, I wanted to ask you, would you be willing to play a song a week from tonight for our MRE dinner? The same time? It's It starts at 6 p.m. And, and you want the song at the end? It doesn't have to be at the end. We could have it be during the cocktail period. <laughs> or during, during, it doesn't have to be any time during the program. And as long as it's a German folk song? What yeah, do you want whatever American, you want to play. What do you want an American sing-along song? Like what do you she think, Lauren? Do you have a I think American sing along might be fun. Anything Erngar plays is fun, but yeah, anything you want to play, let's do an American sing along song. That's a good idea. Okay, we'll do that. And could I make a little correction to when you introduce me? Yes, you may. I think that maybe I came along. You have a different feeling for what I say. I want to clarify that. In all the interviews I had with you, and whenever I speak about growing up in Germany, that I really, I didn't know I had a hard time. I didn't know when I didn't have shoes, when we, I didn't know what a banana or an orange looked like. I, we couldn't buy sugar. I, di I didn't feel deprived. I didn't know anything else. So I wasn't hurting, Todd. I would have to lie to say I was hurting. I was not hurting and I was always, and I hate to say this, happy with Hitler. I knew nobody else. So I want to make that correct. No, absolutely. Definitely. I, I think it's, it's, it's my projection on, on yeah. what you're saying. Absolutely. You know, yeah. for me, I knew nothing else. I was alive. I had an accordion. I had friends. My father was in Russia. But so were many other men and young men, most younger men. My husband, my father was the older one gone and the longest gone. But again, I mean, 
this heartache, it just, you just lived with it. It just was every day and I, I did never felt deprived. I wanted to make sure that's understood. Yeah, and, and I understand that, Ermgard. I'm just saying that like if, I, if I'm, you know, if I were 18 years old and there was a pilot coming down who might kill me, I'd feel like that's something that, you know. Yeah, and again, it was war. Other people got shot, I didn't. And I, exp I was scared for a moment. But then again, I told you, I made my peace with the Lord. And I said, if I'm, uh, whatever, all my sins went, all the sins <laughs> that I ever had told the priest about <laughs> went through my head <laughs> to make sure the Lord would forgive me before I got up there. <laughs> so no, it was, uh, I don't, as I look back today, of course, if I compare my, my uh, grandchildren and my great grandchildren's life growing up to mine, my hair stands up straight at times. It's yeah. just a birthday party recently. All my, my parties in my life in Germany, there were none, but all, everything, all the parties I knew about couldn't cover half of the party that my great great grandchildren for a birthday unbelievable i don't agree with it kids today ellie no i know ermgard absolutely i mean that's why you're that's why we're we so admire your generation and want to hear from you because you really have this perspective of kind of living through hard times that that we're not familiar with my son has set me up twice to record my stories on the internet and to, to have, I just, I'm so, I hate this technical stuff. Push this button and then push that. And then I push five wrong ones before I get the right one and nothing works. And he doesn't want to sit. And I don't want him to sit here when I do what I want. So I never got started, but it's there. It's in there for me to do it. Oh, I gotta, do it. Yes, Bob. Ermgard, yeah. make sure you get your story told i could never get my dad he spent two and a half years in a german pow camp and oh. he would not talk about most of his experiences uh but oh i tried for years to get him to talk and i think of that history that got lost because yes. you know he was those world war one of those world war did not want to talk about the unpleasant situations Just and i know myself i graduated from washington and jefferson they invited me down and some other veterans and we they archived our stories so we're in the national archives you know we told our, and that is so important because who was it uh todd the philosopher santana said those who fail to pay attention to history are going to make the same mistakes over and over you know yes. and we soldiers yes you know, we, we probably hate and despise war more than anybody else yes you know, Nobody uh, liked the war when I grew up during the war. Of course, it didn't dawn on me that American people had to fight like the German soldier had to fight. I only saw the German side. We were so controlled. We had no open press, nothing. So I, my knowledge was very dim and very small and held together. So today I can make comparisons and my mouth goes pretty well. I could record it all. I just, if I have a start, I started writing and quit again. I'm going to do it. Do I, it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Thank you. Do it, please. Preserve Thank that history. You. Thank you. Yeah. You know what, Todd, that um, woman that asked to volunteer, we should hook her up with Ermgard. Yes, Nicole. Nicole. Definitely. I think they'd Nicole make would match. love you, Ermgard. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll do it. Do you people know that I also volunteer at the veteran cemetery out there? And right now we are banned to go there, you know? I know. I know. But I miss it and they tell us how much they miss us volunteers. They need us. Yeah. So let's all hope we can soon do our thing again. Hi, Pat. How are you? I haven't said hello to you yet this evening. Good to see you. Did your dad complain about the Red Cross that you remember? 
I don't recall him complaining about it at all. Um, in fact, our only family Red Cross story was that we loved them because they were the only ones who went in and visited my mom at the hospital when she had my brother on December 17th and was in the hospital for Christmas. They oh, brought her a Christmas tree and little presents. So we had a more positive experience with the Red Cross. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you all for, for joining us tonight. This is great. What a wonderful program. Thank and, you. And, and Betsy, I'll be in touch about scheduling another one. Okay. All right. That sounds good. All right. Very good. All right. Good night, everyone. Take good care. Night. Good night. Good night.